Welcome back to Dielectric Videos. Today we're going to be doing another Vintage Tech Time Electronics video. I haven't done one of these in a long time, so I hope this one will be lots of fun. Alright, so let's open up this package. What will we find inside? Hopefully something good. Looks like we got another package inside the package. And what's inside the inside package? Yet another package. And now for the moment we've all been waiting for, here it is. Well, we already seem to have some parts. But yes, indeed, what this is, this is a pre-World War II electric train power supply. This transformer is designed to power model electric train sets it's made by a company called American Flyer, and according to the seller, it dates to before World War II. I did some preliminary research on these, and apparently they were made ranging from 1916 all the way up into the late 1930s, before they switched from the notched, stepped voltage controller to the linearly variable voltage controller. So this one is definitely pretty old, at least pre-war. This is going to be really cool, because what I'd like to do is see if we can get it operating, and if it does indeed operate, I'd like to do some characterization tests on it to see how much power we can get out of it, and if we can indeed get 50 watts out of it, I'm planning to make a charger out of this to be able to power modern day electronics and other equipment, i.e. laptops, USB devices, perhaps even the electric skateboard. So let's get inside and see what we can see. I just want to see how this handle moves. It definitely does move, it's not stuck, Although, I'm dubious of how good quality the connections are here. These will definitely require some improvement, perhaps some tightening from within the device. Let's take a look at the service entrance, I guess you'd call it, where the mains power comes into the device. It has this nice ceramic insulator to ensure that the case doesn't short to the windings or to the conductors. However, it would appear that these wires have lost their insulation, and this one feels loose enough it's probably lost most of its uh, strands of conductor as well. So I'm probably going to get inside here and see how far back these run, maybe replace the connections all the way up to, the, uh, to this ceramic part, and hopefully we're going to have a serviceable transformer on the inside. I'm hoping I'll be able to get inside by removing this screw. I, I'm wondering if I really will, because these rivets would uh, lead me to believe perhaps not. Uh, but maybe the top cover will actually come off of it. So let's go ahead and try that. Well, after prying a little bit at the sheet metal, I was able to get this open. It doesn't look particularly good. The windings look pretty dark in here. I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but it kind of looks as if it got burnt at some point, like the transformer overheated. So it's possible this is not going to do us any good. We might just use this as a... Uh, an enclosure for sort of a faux vintage device, but it might be interesting to go ahead and try to wind it up anyway, just to see what we can get. So here's our conductor. That's our mains coming in. Looks like it's got some solder joint here. I'll be a bit careful about this white material because this could be asbestos. It's got some fish paper, probably insulation. And it's hard to tell where the output terminals are connected. I don't really want to bend it around too much, but I kind of do want to see what, uh, what it's all about here. And then the other conductor is also going to this solder joint. So, man, if it wasn't so badly connected here, I'd be inclined to try it. What I'll do is I'll strip the insulation off here, I'll check continuity with a meter, and then I'll see if we can wind this up slowly on the variac. Let's have a look at the continuity between the input conductors. So it's not open, I think. It's kind of jumping around on the meter. Maybe it is open, actually. Well, no, now it looks good. About, f I saw like 30 ohms. I think there must be a loose connection here maybe around this one. So maybe I should actually be measuring at the transformer here. There's a lot of oxidation on this thing. 
hard to get through that oxide layer. All right, I'm seeing 24.4 ohms, pretty steady. So there's a bad connection in here. I think I'll probably replace these conductors. And the solder joint is pretty badly oxidized, but the transformer is not an inst it's not totally a hard short. It's just, it's around 24 ohms of series resistance, which for a DC tester like this would be kind of expected on a transformer like that. What I don't know is whether the windings in this burnt area are going to be shorted together. It's, it's very possible they are, or that could just be the color of the lacquer. So what I think I'm going to do next is pull these wires. I'm going to try and desolder them from the taps on the transformer and attach new wire, which we can then uh, use to connect to it. I've got a replacement cord here. This one is actually old, but it's not period accurate to this vintage of device. Eventually, I'll probably go in if I end up using this uh, with some of that faux cloth cord that has the PVC insulated cord inside, just so it's a little more period accurate. But for the time being, this is a good compromise since this is what I have, and it is actually somewhat vintage, probably mid-60s. Uh, and it's in good condition, so it shouldn't give too much trouble in terms of shorting out. So I'll go ahead and wind this in, and I'll see if I can solder it to those conductors on the transformer. All right, let's see if we can get any solder to take on this original conductor from this transformer here. Now that is definitely not asbestos because it melts or it burns rather when my iron touches it. So that's actually good for me. Not necessarily good for the reliability of the unit, but that's all right. However, the solder does seem to be having some difficulty taking on that conductor. So might have to scrape some of the lacquer off of it if there is any. Sometimes if you heat it up enough, the solder will just grab on, but not always. I'll go ahead and get a paper towel to wipe the iron. We'll get some flux and try that with some flux. All right, I've added some flux. I've wiped the iron. I'm gonna give this one a try again. It might be getting close. I'm going to try the other one as well. This already had some soldered conductor on it, but the oxidation is so severe that it's hard to get the solder to bridge through. Oh yeah, no, that just did. So that one got, that one took. This one's still a little sketchy. We'll come back to that one. What I'll do now is I'm going to tin these conductors, the new ones, and I could put some heat shrink on that. I think I'll probably use electrical tape in this case. All right, well, I did manage to get both sides connected. So I'm gonna try to pull the sheathing back over that. And then I'll see if I can maybe get a little bit of electrical tape or insulating tape over this so that it doesn't short out. So I overturned the container and a few things fell out. These are the receiving nuts that actually go through the transformer and hold the bolts in place. And it looks like the transformer was sitting on these paper insulator washers. So it's going to be important, I think, to be sure that the, uh, the transformer is not sitting flat on this metal when it's in service. So I'll have to do some more advanced surgery to take this apart and put all these parts back in. Nevertheless, before we move any further, I'd like to be sure that this is going to work properly. So we'll go ahead and power it up on the Variac, bring it up slow, and see if we get any voltage out of the output. All right, I have the Variac hooked up and I have the multimeter on AC. I put a 100 ohm resistor across it to give the transformer a little bit of load so we're not showing basically the open circuit voltage all the time. And this will give me a much cleaner contact point to measure off of. So let's start winding the Variac and see if anything goes bad. I'm already seeing voltage. Variac's humming though, which is a bad sign. So I'm gonna back it back down and I'm going to get a measurement of the current on there. This time I wired it in series with a 60 watt light bulb. That way we can see if it's drawing excessive current. The bulb might glow even under normal operation since the transformer will have some magnetizing current, but this should tell us without uh, creating a massive uh, explosion if there's a short circuit or anything like that. So again, we're going up in voltage. I'm actually going to set the wiper to the highest setting before I turn this up rather. I'd like to see what is my maximum output voltage. So let's try that one more time. Up we go, one volt, four volts. 
Chat Variac does not sound happy. I gotta figure out why that's buzzing so badly. Because the bulb's not on, so it's not drawing an excessive current. Or is that this that's buzzing? Oh, that's this guy that's buzzing. So it's being loud as heck. It's not glowing the bulb, though. Bulb's glowing a little bit. We're getting 9.5. I'm going to turn that down. So it is working. We're getting power. Now, that grinding, buzzing sound sounds terrifying. However, keep in mind we have removed the bolts that constrain the laminations together on the transformer. Once we put these back in and crank them down, there's a good chance that vibration will go away. It's also an extremely good sign that we were able to generate all the voltage that this is really supposed to. Nominally, it's 8 volts, but we've got this nice 120 volt AC input, and this thing is only rated for 110. So, so far, it's looking promising, like this might actually be serviceable. So now that we've confirmed that it is able to generate power, the next step is going to be to reassemble it with the insulating washers on the bottom of the transformer. Unfortunately, that likely means we're going to have to pull these front uh, output posts from the unit in order to get the whole thing out so that we can get those washers back into place. So that's what I'm going to have to do next. So I'll see what I can do and uh, then I'll get cut back into the video once I have the thing apart. All right, so I managed to get the nuts on here. I managed to get the bolts all the way through the transformer and get the little paper washers on both sides of the transformer. So what I'm gonna do now is try my best to thread these nuts down. And if all goes well, I should be able to actually get this thing uh, back into kind of its original configuration. The goal here is to try to constrain all of those laminations in the transformer in order to try to mitigate the buzzing. If it doesn't mitigate the buzzing, that might just be the way it is, in which case it's probably not going to see any serious permanent service. That type of vibration will wear away at the windings over time, and is also just generally obnoxious sounding. So let's go ahead and just gradually, and I'll see if I can, you can see, I'm now tightening these nuts down here. Gradually tighten these down, and then what I want to do is just fold this thing all the way back up and put power to it, see if we can now start load testing it. Because what I really want to know is, does it stack up to its 50 watt nameplate rating? That's enough to run a lot of cool equipment, if it in fact does. All right, I've got the transformer properly locked down with these nuts. I verified that the primary windings are not being compressed or touching these bolts. Now I'm going to put some power to it. We'll just see if it's any quieter than it was before. So I'm plugging it into the Variac output. And let's wind it up. Oh, way quieter. You can't even hear the thing. That's awesome. It goes to show how important compressing the laminations is in any transformer system. Right, so I think now would be a good time to put the cover back on and let's put this thing to work. So when I took it off originally, I kind of just bent the sheet metal a little bit. So I'm hoping I won't even have to bend it back. Hopefully it'll just snap on like that. I think that's actually how it was kind of meant to go together at the factory. Ah, it's a little bit tight though, so might have to do a little bit of coercion. Ah, there we go. All back together. So there is our little power supply right there. I'm just going to verify there's no obvious short circuits. Well, it runs up to 120 volts. Doesn't seem to complain too much. All right, so now I want to see how it runs on straight 120 volts. So I'm going to take the light bulb out of my ballast circuit here, and I'm going to go ahead and put a 15 amp, or actually that's a 20 amp, fast flow fuse in just for some extra safety. Now what I'm going to do here is take this uh, kilowatt type meter, I don't, this is an off brand, but take this meter, and I'm going to power it up from the Variac, and I'm going to tune the Variac up to 120 volts. So let's go ahead, see if we can go get it to show the voltage. It just did for a second. Maybe I have to go through all the functions again. So it's pretty high on this Variac. It's saying 131, so I'm just gonna back that down. And my house typically gets around 125 volts at the wall, so I'm gonna just let this up quite a bit because I want it to be realistic of how the system actually operates. So there's 126 volts on the clock. What we want to know is what kind of wattage 
does it use? We'll check the amperage and we'll check the wattage when it's being run from this voltage. So first we're gonna just connect it. And it's drawing about, oof, that's a bit, that's a fair bit, half an amp, 465 milliamps. It's dissipating 5.4 watts. So five watts is kind of a lot for a package that size, but it could probably do that most of the time. But you know, again, this is unloaded. So I kind of want to just see if I back the voltage down, how much wattage it then uses. So 126.9, let's back that down to, uh, how about its original design parameter of 110? Because I may end up just putting some series resistance or something in it to just help it do a little better on today's modern grid. 111, close enough. So now it's, do, it's drawn half the current did before, so obviously we're seeing some saturation effects. And it's still dissipating a proper 3.6 watts. Actually, is that, no, oh, 4.7, okay. So it's dissipating a fair bit still, but not nearly as much as it would have been with double the current flowing through the transformer. We'll proceed with some actual load testing now. We'll hook up a dynamic load and we'll see what we can get. All right, I put together a little voltage doubling rectifier. This uses two diodes to basically double the peak voltage at the output of the transformer. And I have basically two paralleled 10,000 microfarad capacitors on either side. So this is 20 millifarads of capacitance on each side. And we should theoretically be getting double our peak voltage at the terminals of the two capacitor banks. I couldn't help but think as I was threading these nuts on and attaching the uh, rectifier that some kid in the 1920s was probably just as excited to connect his, brand, his or her, I should say, brand new train set to this unit as I am now to connect this rectifier and load dummy test to the same unit. That's pretty cool. So let's go ahead and set up this, uh, this little uh, dynamic load. This one's actually from Amazon. It's uh, rated, I believe, for 180 watts and up to 300 volts. So it should be more than adequate for what we need. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn the uh, Variac on. So the Variac's on, the dynamic load is on, and let's see if we're getting power. It says 4.9 watts on our display over there. So I turn this all the way down to start. I'm gonna connect it. So positive, negative needs to go on this side because that's the negative uh, diode and positive needs to go here. And it says here we're making 25.9 volts and zero amps, obviously, because I haven't turned it on yet. So uh, let's see how much we can draw and how much it sags under load. I'm drawing two amps. It, we're down to 11 volts, so not a ton of power. We've got to see kind of where our maximum power point is. So that's netting us like 26 watts. Yeah, it drops to like seven volts once we're above three amps. So we're really not getting a ton. I'll turn that back down. Same open circuit voltage, but yeah, not quite 50 watts, that's for sure. So yeah, three amps. If we really wanted to get 50 watts out of it, we would need to be seeing like five amps at 10 volts or maybe three amps at, uh, you know, 16 or 17 volts. I am wondering if maybe some of these contacts could stand to be cleaned up. Eh, marginal, doesn't make much of a difference. But note, notice we're drawing 77 watts here, so I better turn that down quickly because if we're only making like 15 watts here, maybe maybe 20 watts, something like that. That means there's 50 watts going into the transformer. So that's probably not doing great. So reasonably, I'm thinking this is not gonna make anywhere near 50 watts. It might give us enough for like a USB charger or something. You know, maybe we run it up at 10 watts. So what we'll do is just run it up to see how high we need to go on amperage to get to 10 watts, for example. So 19 volts at the output is getting us 0.83 amps. 
So that would be, that actually would be almost 20 watts. That's pretty good. One amp, 18 volts. And then we're using 30 at the wall. That means we're dropping about 10 in here, roughly, maybe a bit more. So this would be getting a fair bit toasty at that rating, but it would still be probably holding up. So this might be an ideal case, for example, to run a 20 watt, maybe a two USB port output, maybe even a USB type C for a 20 watt load. I think that would be pretty cool. Uh, I don't think it's gonna be running my laptop or my skateboard, unfortunately, since those need about 50 watts respectively, but um, you know, we're probably gonna get about half of that at this level. It'd be interesting maybe to see if this thing will hold up if I just leave it running for a while at this uh, 18, this one amp setting, 18 volts. Might be worth just trying some other taps as well, just to see. Maybe one of the taps is just a bit gunked. So we get now 15 volts. Can we go higher on amperage? Yeah, pretty much the same sag. So I do think we're gonna get the best performance on that top bung there. So yeah, now we're doing 15 volts at 1.6 amps. So just out of curiosity, we're, I wanna kind of find the maximum power point on this thing. So about 24 watts at two amps, 26 watts. And at three amps, we're, let's see if I can get it to three amps. At three amps, we're doing about three times nine, so 27. And at four amps, we're doing like six volts. So that's going to be, you know, 24 again. So we're basically maxed out around three amps. But my guess is that's going to just roast this transformer if I try to pull out three amps for any amount of time. So, yeah, I'd say maybe one amp, maybe two. Yeah, I'd say about 20 watts is what we should reasonably expect. So I'll go ahead and come back to this in a little bit after it's been run in for a while at that, uh, I'm gonna say maybe 1.5 amp level, and then we'll see how it does. I figured while it's running this load test, I might see if there's any primary to secondary isolation. So I'm gonna take a light bulb like this and connect one end of it to one of the terminals. It doesn't really matter which. And then I'll take the other end and I'm just going to probe against the main supply. So on the neutral, light bulb stays off, which is good. On the hot, light bulb also stays off. So it is isolated from primary to secondary. Not that I would necessarily trust it in a life safety application, but that is good to know in that it's more likely we're, less, we're not going to blow the whole equipment system up if we happen to connect something over here to ground in any, in any case. All right, well, I've had it running for a bit less than an hour. You see it says an hour and two minutes on this meter. I didn't have it at full load at the very beginning, but as you can see, it is now still operating. The surface of the body of the transformer is warm, but not like extremely hot. The handle's a bit on the hot side, but not what I would say is excessive, particularly considering that this is kind of what I expected to be the highest uh, point of resistance in the circuit. So pretty good performance. I did end up turning the voltage up to around 120 just to make it a little more realistic of what you might see in the, if you hooked it up to the actual AC mains grid uh, in, you know, nowadays. And now it's producing about 23 watts uh, at 1.5 amps of load. And that is looking really nice. I did make a rather interesting discovery here. Now this is originally designed for 110 volts at 60 cycles. It even says so on the container. But we live in the age of power electronics, so why not try some other combinations of voltage and frequency? I've modified this power inverter to step 12 volts or anything from like 12 to 15 volts up to a 240 volt AC output, but to run at 400 Hertz. That's right, this is running at aircraft frequency. And in doing so, I've actually found that I can transfer way more power than previously possible through this transformer. In fact, if you look at the display, you'll actually see right now we are transferring 72 watts. That's right, that's basically three times what we were able to run at 60 hertz and 120 volts. 
we're only drawing about maybe 90 or 100 watts at the power supply, meaning not only is it running at much higher power output, but it's actually running more efficiently as well. I thought that was pretty cool. Obviously not the intended application and doesn't really make for an extremely useful power supply when we're still using a 60 Hertz mains grid, but nevertheless, I thought that was quite interesting. I should also note that in modifying this, I did switch to a full wave bridge rectifier since running the input at 240 volts means the output comes out at double the voltage as well. In this case, around 16 volts AC with no load. I thought that was pretty cool. In case you're wondering why this works and why increasing the frequency and voltage would lead to higher power transfer, the first thing to keep in mind is that this transformer was being primarily limited in supply voltage by the saturation current that the transformer would draw as the voltage was increased. The higher the applied voltage is for a given frequency, the more current it will take to magnetize the iron core of the transformer, and beyond a certain point, the iron core can no longer be more strongly magnetized. This is referred to as saturation, and when that happens, the transformer core basically stops being an inductor, and the transformer begins acting like a short circuit or a, or a low value resistor. And that's actually what was happening when this was running on 60 Hertz, even as uh, low as 120 volts. By increasing the frequency to 400 Hertz, which happened to be a higher frequency that I have available from a 400 Hertz uh, inverter module, I was therefore able to basically afford to run much higher voltages through the transformer without driving it into saturation. As such, I was able to run this at 240 volts instead of 120, and therefore I was able to cut my current in half uh, in order to get the same power output because the output voltage is of course going to be double. If you wonder why I can't just keep increasing frequency indefinitely, eventually there will be a point at which the voltage or the frequency becomes so high that the actual magnetization and demagnetization of the transformer core becomes a dominant loss because every time you flip magnetization in the core, it actually uh, dissipates a little bit of energy. So there is sort of a sweet spot all right, it's about two weeks later and I've had this model train transformer in service powering all sorts of equipment. I've been using the higher frequency and higher voltage power source and it's been working extremely nicely. I 3D printed this enclosure for all of the output electronics that condition the output power and I was indeed successfully able to power my laptop throughout all of my daily use uh, for the machine, my electric skateboard, and even my hoverboard. But that's not all. I was also able to charge all of these batteries up to their full state of charge with some of that excess surplus power that I had available. Well, I hope you enjoyed this restoration and vintage tech time video. I thought it was really amazing that I was able to power all sorts of modern day loads up to an exceeding 50 watts from this very old 1920s train transformer. That being said, I'm probably not going to be using this for too much longer since it does draw quite a bit more power than the more efficient modern day chargers do, and additionally it's rather bulky. I think it's a really cool little work piece to show the sort of restorations that you can do and the things I've done on this channel, and I'm definitely going to be keeping it around for display purposes. So hopefully you enjoyed this project as much as I did, and I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.